I'm Pat Tully, and this is Reading Aloud. This evening, I'll be reading a chapter from Henry David Thoreau's book, Cape Cod. This book was published a few years after Thoreau's death in 1862, and it describes in Thoreau's distinctive style several trips he took to the Cape. The chapter I'll be reading is called The Shipwreck. Wishing to get a better view than I had yet had of the ocean, which, we are told, covers more than two-thirds of the globe, but of which man who lives a few miles inland may never see any trace, more than that of another world, I made a visit to Cape Cod in October 1849, another the succeeding June, and another to Truro in July of 1855, the first and last time with a single companion, the second time alone. I have spent, in all, about three weeks on the Cape, walked from East Ham to Provincetown, twice on the Atlantic side, and once on the Bay side also, excepting four or five miles, and crossed the Cape half a dozen times on my way. But having come so fresh to the sea, I have got but little salted. My readers must expect only so much saltness as the land breeze acquires from blowing over an arm of the sea, or is tasted on the windows and the bark of trees twenty miles inland, after September gales. I have been accustomed to make excursions to the ponds within ten miles of Concord, but latterly I have extended my excursions to the seashore. I did not see why I might not make a book on Cape Cod, as well as my neighbor on human culture. It is but another name for the same thing, and hardly a sandier phase of it. As for my title, I suppose that the word cape is from the French cap, which is from the Latin caput, a head, which is perhaps from the verb capere, to take, that being the part by which we take hold of a thing. Take time by the forelock. It is also the safest part to take a serpent by. And as for cod, that was derived directly from that great store of codfish which Captain Bartholomew Gosnold caught here in 1602, which fish appears to have been so called from the Saxon word cod, a case in which seeds are lodged, either from the form of the fish or the quantity of spawn it contains, whence also perhaps codling and coddle to cook green like peas. Cape Cod is the bared and bended arm of Massachusetts. The shoulder is at Buzzards Bay, the elbow or crazy bone at Cape Malabar, the wrist at Truro, and the sandy fist at Provincetown, behind which the state stands on her guard, with her back to the green mountains and her feet planted on the floor of the ocean, like an athlete protecting her bay, boxing with northeast storms, and ever and anon, heaving up her Atlantic adversary from the lap of earth, ready to thrust forward her other fist, which keeps guard the while upon her breast at Cape Ann. On studying the map, I saw that there must be an uninterrupted beach on the east or outside of the forearm of the Cape, more than 30 miles from the general line of the coast, which would afford a good sea view, but that on account of an opening in the beach, forming the entrance to Nosset Harbor in Orleans, I must strike it in East Ham, if I approached it by land, and I probably could walk thence straight to Race Point, about 28 miles, and not meet with any obstruction. We left Concord, Massachusetts on Tuesday, October 9, 1849. On reaching Boston, we found that the Provincetown steamer, which should have got in the day before, had not yet arrived on account of a violent storm, and, as we noticed in the streets, a handbill headed death, 145 lives lost at Cohasset, we decided to go by way of Cohasset. We found many Irish in the cars, going to identify bodies and to sympathize with the survivors, and also to attend the funeral, which was to take place in the afternoon. And when we arrived at Cohasset, it appeared that nearly all the passengers were bound for the beach which was about a mile distant, and many other persons were flocking in from the neighboring country. There were several hundreds of them streaming off over Cohasset Common in that direction, 
some on foot and some in wagons, and among them were some sportsmen in their hunting jackets, with their guns and game bags and dogs. As we passed the graveyard, we saw a large hole, like a cellar, freshly dug there, and, just before reaching the shore, by a pleasantly winding and rocky road, we met several hay riggings and farm wagons coming away toward the meeting house, each loaded with three large, rough deal boxes. We did not need to ask what was in them. The owners of the wagons were made the undertakers. Many horses and carriages were fastened to the fences near the shore, and for a mile or more up and down, the beach was covered with people looking out for bodies and examining the fragments of the wreck. There was a small island called Brook Island with a hut on it lying just off the shore. This is said to be the rockiest shore in Massachusetts, from Nantasket to Situate, hard cyanitic rocks, which the waves have laid bare but have not been able to crumble. It has been the scene of many a shipwreck. The brig St. John from Galway, Ireland, laden with emigrants, was wrecked on Sunday morning. It was now Tuesday morning, and the sea was still breaking violently on the rocks. There were 18 or 20 of the same large boxes that I have mentioned, lying on a green hillside, a few rods from the water, and surrounded by a crowd. The bodies which had been recovered, twenty-seven or eight in all, had been collected there. Some were rapidly nailing down the lids, others were carting the boxes away, and others were lifting the lids, which were yet loose, and peeping under the cloths for each body, with such rags as still adhered to it, was covered loosely with a white sheet. I witnessed no signs of grief but there was a sober dispatch of business which was affecting. One man was seeking to identify a particular body, and one undertaker or carpenter was calling to another to know in what box a certain child was put. I saw many marble feet and matted heads as the cloths were raised, and one livid, swollen, and mangled body of a drowned girl, who probably had intended to go out to service in some American family to which some rags still adhered, with a string half concealed by the flesh about its swollen neck, the coiled-up wreck of a human hulk, gashed by the rocks or fishes, so that the bone and muscle were exposed but quite bloodless, merely red and white, with wide open and staring eyes, yet lusterless, dead lights, or like the cabin windows of a stranded vessel, filled with sand. Sometimes there were two or more children, or a parent or child, in the same box, and on the lid would perhaps be written in red chalk, Bridget such a one, and sister's child. The surrounding sward was covered with bits of sails and clothing. I have since heard from one who lives by this beach, that a woman who had come over before, but had left her infant behind for her sister to bring, came and looked into these boxes and saw in one probably the same whose superscription I have quoted, her child in her sister's arms, as if the sister had meant to be found thus. And within three days after, the mother died from the effect of that sight. We turned from this and walked along the rocky shore. In the first cove were strewn what seemed to be fragments of a vessel and small pieces mixed with sand and seaweed and great quantities of feathers but it looked so old and rusty that I at first took it to be some old wreck which had lain there many years. I even thought of Captain Kidd, and that the feathers were those which sea fowl had cast there, and perhaps there might be some tradition about it in the neighborhood. I asked a sailor if that was the St. John. He said it was. I asked him where she struck. He pointed to a rock in front of us, a mile from the shore, called the Grampus Rock, and added, You can see a part of her now sticking up. It looks like a small boat. I saw it. It was thought to be held by the chain cables and, and the anchors. I asked if the bodies which I saw were all that were drowned. Not a quarter of them, said he. Where are the rest? Most of them right underneath that piece, you see. It appeared to us that there was enough rubbish to make a wreck of the large vessel in this cove alone 
and that it would take many days to cart it off. It was several feet deep, and here and there there was a bonnet or a jacket on it. In the very midst of the crowd about this wreck, there were men in carts busily collecting the seedweed which the storm had cast up, and conveying it beyond the reach of the tide, though they were often obliged to separate fragments of clothing from it, and they might at any moment have found a human body under it. Drown who might, they did not forget that this weed was of valuable manure. This shipwreck had not produced a visible vibration in the fabric of society. About a mile south we could see, rising above the rocks, the mast of the British brig, which the St. John had endeavored to follow, which had slipped her cables and, by good luck, run into the mouth of Cohasset Harbor. A little further along the shore we saw a man's clothes on a rock. Further, a woman's scarf, a gown, a straw bonnet, the brig's caboose, and one of her masts high and dry, broken into several pieces. In another rocky cove, several rods from the water, and behind rocks twenty feet high, lay a part of one side of the vessel, still hanging together. It was perhaps forty feet long by fourteen wide. I was even more surprised at the power of the waves exhibited on this shattered fragment than I had been at the sight of the smaller fragments before. The largest timbers and iron braces were broken superfluously, and I saw that no material could withstand the power of the waves that iron must go to pieces in such a case, and an iron vessel would be cracked up like an eggshell on the rocks. Some of these timbers, however, were so rotten that I could almost thrust my umbrella through them. They told us that some were saved on this piece, and also showed where the sea had heaved it into this cove, which was now dry. When I saw where it, it had come in and in what condition, I wondered that any had been saved on it. A little further on, the crowd of men were collecting about the mate of the St. John, who was telling his story. He was a slim-looking youth who spoke of the captain as the master, and seemed a little excited. He was saying that when they jumped into the boat, she filled, and, the vessel lurching, the weight of the water in the boat caused the painter to break, and so they were separated. Whereat one man came away saying, Well, I don't see, but he tells a straight story enough. You see, the weight of the water in the boat broke the painter. A boat full of water is very heavy, and so on, in a loud and impertinently earnest tone, as if he had a bet depending on it, but he had no humane interest in the matter. Another, a large man, stood nearby upon a rock, gazing into the sea, and chewing large, large quids of tobacco, as if that habit were forever confirmed in him. Come, says another to his companion, let's be off. We've seen the whole of it. It's no use to stay for the funeral. Further, we saw one standing upon a rock, who, we were told, was one that was saved. He was a sober-looking man, dressed in a jacket and gray pantaloons, with his hands in, his, in the pockets. I asked him a few questions, which he answered, but he seemed unwilling to talk about it, and soon walked away. By his side stood one of the lifeboatmen, in an oilcloth jacket, who told us how they went to the relief of the British brig, thinking that the boat of the St. John, which they passed on the way, held all her crew, for the waves prevented their seeing those who were on the vessel, though they might have saved some had they known they were any there. A little further was the flag of the St. John spread on a rock to dry, and held down by stones at the corners. This frail but essential and significant portion of the vessel, which had so long been the sport of the winds, was sure to reach the shore. There were one or two houses visible from these rocks, in which were some of the survivors recovering from the shock which their bodies and minds has, had sustained. One was not expected to live. We kept on down the shore as far as a promontory called Whitehead, that we might see more of the Cohasset rocks. In a little cove, within half a mile, there were an old man and his son collecting, with their team, the seaweed which, had, which that fatal storm had cast up, as serenely employed as if there had never been a wreck in the world, though they were within sight of the Grampus Rock, 
on which the St. John had struck. The old man had heard that there was a wreck and knew most of the particulars, but he said that he had not been up there since it happened. It was the wrecked weed that concerned him most, rockweed, kelp, and seaweed, as he named them, which he carted to his barnyard, and those bodies were to him but other weeds which the tide cast up, but which were of no use to him. We afterwards came to the lifeboat in its harbor, waiting for another emergency, and in the afternoon we saw the funeral procession at a distance, at the head of which walked the captain with the other survivors. On the whole, it was not so impressive a scene as I might have expected. If I had found one body cast upon the beach in some lonely place, it would have affected me more. I sympathized rather with the winds and waves, as if to toss and mangle those poor human bodies was the order of the day. If this was the law of nature, why waste any time in awe or pity? If the last day were come, we should not think so much about the separation of friends or the blighted prospects of individuals. I saw that corpses might be multiplied as on the field of battle until they no longer affected us in any degree as exceptions to the common lot of humanity. Take all the graveyards together, they are always the majority. It is the individual in private that demands our sympathy. A man can attend but one funeral in the course of his life, can behold but one corpse. Yet I saw that the inhabitants of the shore would be not a little affected by this event. They would watch there many days and nights for the sea to give up its dead, and their imaginations and sympathies would supply the place of mourners far away, who as yet knew nothing of the wreck. Many days after this, some, something white was seen floating on the water by one who was sauntering on the beach. It was approached in a boat and found to be the body of a woman, which had risen in an upright position whose white cap was blown back with the wind. I saw that the beauty of the shore itself was wrecked for many a lonely walker there, until he could perceive, at last, how its beauty was enhanced by wrecks like this, and it acquired thus a rarer and sublimer beauty still. Why care for these dead bodies? They really have no friends but the worms or fishes. Their owners were coming to the new world, as Columbus and the pilgrims did. They were within a mile of its shores, but before they could reach it, they emigrated to a newer world than ever Columbus dreamed of, yet one of whose existence we believe that there is far more universal and convincing evidence, though it has not yet been discovered by science. Then Columbus had of this, not merely mariner's tales and some paltry driftwood and seaweed, but a continual drift and instinct to all our shores. I saw their empty hulks that came to land, but they themselves, meanwhile, were cast upon some shore yet further west, toward which we are all tending, and which we shall reach at last. It may be through storm and darkness as they did. No doubt we have reason to thank God that they have not been shipwrecked into life again. The mariner who makes the safest port in heaven, perchance, seems to his friends on earth to be shipwrecked, for they deem Boston Harbor the better place. Though perhaps invisible to them, a skillful pilot comes to meet him, and the fairest and balmiest gales blow off that coast. His good ship makes the land in halcyon days, and he kisses the shore in rapture there, while his old hulk tosses in the surf here. It is hard to part with one's body, but, no doubt, it is easy enough to do without it once it is gone. All the, their plans and hopes burst like a bubble, infants by the score dashed on the rocks by the enraged Atlantic Ocean. No, no, if the St. John did not make her port here, she has been telegraphed there. The strongest wind cannot stagger a spirit. It is a spirit's breath. A just man's purpose cannot be split on any grampus or material rock, but itself will split on rocks until it succeeds. The verses addressed to Columbus, dying, may, with some slight alterations, be applied to the passengers of the St. John. Soon with them will all be over, 
soon the voyage will be begun. That shall bear them to discover, far away a land unknown. Land that each alone must visit, but no tidings bring to men. For no sailor once departed, ever hath returned again. No carved wood, no broken branches, ever drift from that far wild. He who on that ocean launches, meets no course of angel child. Undismayed by noble sailors, spread then spread your canvas out. Spirits on a sea of ether, soon shall ye serenely float. Where the deep no plummet soundeth, fear no hidden breakers there, and the fanning wings of angels shall your bark right onward bear. Quit now, full of heart and comfort, these rude shores they are of earth, where the rosy clouds are parting, there the blessed isles lean forth. One summer day since this, I came this way on foot along the shore from Boston. It was so warm that some horses had climbed to the very top of the ramparts of the old fort at Hull, where there was hardly room to turn around for the sake of the breeze. The Detura stramonium, or thorn apple, was in full bloom along the beach, and at sight of this cosmopolite, this Captain Cook among plants, carried in ballast all over the world, I felt as if I were on the highway of nations. Say, rather, this Viking king of the bays, for it is not an innocent plant. It suggests not merely commerce, but its attendant vices, as if its fibers were the stuff of which pirates spin their yarns. I heard the voices of men shouting aboard a vessel, half a mile from the shore, which sounded as if they were in a barn in the country, they being between the sails. It was a purely rural sound. As I looked over the water, I saw the isles rapidly wasting away, the sea nibbling voraciously at the continent, the springing arch of a hill suddenly interrupted, as at Port Alderton, what botanists might call pre-morse, showing by its curve against the sky how much space it must have occupied, where now was water only. On the other hand, these wrecks of isles were being fancifully arranged into new shores, as at Hog Island, inside of Hull, where everything seemed to be gently lapsing into futurity. This isle had got the very form of a ripple, and I thought that the inhabitants should bear a ripple for device on their shields, a wave passing over them with the detura, which is said to produce mental alienation of long duration without affecting bodily health, springing from its edge. The most interesting thing which I heard of in this township of Hull was an unfailing spring, whose locality was pointed out to me on the side of a distant hill as I was panting along the shore, though I did not visit it. Perhaps if I should go through Rome, it would be some spring on the Capitoline Hill that I should remember the longest. It is true I was somewhat interested in the well at the old French fort, which was said to be 90 feet deep, with a cannon at the bottom of it. On Nantasket Beach, I counted a dozen chaises from the public house. From time to time, the riders turned their horses toward the sea, standing in the water for the coolness, and I saw the value of beaches to cities for the sea breeze and the bath. At Jerusalem village, the inhabitants were collecting in haste, before a thunder shower now approaching, the Irish moss which they had spread to dry. The shower passed on one side and gave me a few drops only, which did not cool the air. I merely felt a puff upon my cheek, though within sight a vessel was capsized in the bay, and several others dragged their anchors and were near going ashore. The sea bathing at Cohasset Rocks was perfect. The water was purer and more transparent than any I had ever seen. There was not a particle of mud or slime about it. The bottom being sandy, I could see the sea perch swimming about. The smooth and fantastically worn rocks and the perfectly clean and tress-like rock weeds falling over you and attached so firmly to the rocks that you could pull yourself up by them greatly enhanced the luxury of the bath. The stripe of barnacles just above the weeds reminded me of some vegetable growth, 
the buds and petals and seed vessels of flowers. They lay along the seams of the rock like buttons on a waistcoat. It was one of the hottest days in the year, yet I found the water so icy cold that I could swim but a stroke or two, and thought that, in the cape case of shipwreck, there would be more danger of being chilled to death than simply drowned. One immersion was enough to make you forget the dog days utterly. Though you were sweltering before, it will take you half an hour now to remember that it was ever warm. There were the tawny rocks like lions couchant, defying the ocean, whose waves incessantly dashed against and scoured them with vast quantities of gravel. The water held in their little hollows on the receding of the tide was so crystalline that I could not believe it salt, but wished to drink it, and higher up were basins of fresh water left by the rain, all which, being also of different depths and temperature, were convenient for different kinds of baths. Also, the larger hollows in the smoothed rocks formed the most convenient of seats in dressing rooms. In these respects, it was the most perfect seashore that I had seen. I saw in Cohasset, separated from the sea only by a narrow beach, a handsome but shallow lake of some 400 acres, which, I was told, the sea had tossed over the beach in a great storm in the spring, and after the alewives had passed into it, it had stopped up its outlet, and now the alewives were dying by thousands, and the inhabitants were apprehending a pestilence as the water evaporated. It had live rocky islets in it. This rock shore is called Pleasant Cove on some maps. On the map of Cohasset, that name appears to be confined to the particular cove where I saw the wreck of the St. John. The ocean did not look now as if any were ever shipwrecked in it. It was not grand and sublime, but beautiful as a lake. Not a vestige of a wreck was visible, nor could I believe that the bones of many a shipwrecked man were buried in that pure sand. The end. Thank you very much for listening in, and I hope you have a very good week.